Good evening, everybody. Uh, we're so pleased to see uh, so many people here uh, for this evening's uh, event, film event. Uh, we're uh, very pleased to be screening uh, a band called Death, and we have uh, an unusual pleasure for us. We don't get to hear too often from directors and producers of films, uh, but today we have uh, Mark Covino and Jeff Hallett here um, who are going to uh, give an introduction about uh, how the film came together and created it. And there will be some time if you have some questions for them, um, please uh, please ask them. And we're, we'll record this and we'll uh, let people see what they have to say. And I just wanted to say a couple of house rules. We don't allow food or drink um, in this theater, um, uh, but we do have some water fountains just outside and restrooms are outside as well. Um, so once we're done with the introduction, um, we will have uh, a quick turnover so we can get the lights and the camera out, and then we'll start the film. So I hope you enjoy, and here are Mark and Jeff. Thanks for having us, guys. <laughs> really appreciate it. Um, I'm Mark Covino, and this is Jeff Hallett. <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, we're going to give you a, a very quick, uh, brief intro into how this all came together um and if you have any questions before the movie starts we can probably answer it one or two and we might even do a short q a at the ending too because you'll obviously have questions um but yeah do you want to start so how this all came together <laughs> so um the film started actually i uh, had heard um from the hackney sons um especially bobby hackney jr he said um, we're covering my dad's music at this place called the Monkey House in uh, Winooski, Vermont. You should come check it out. I was living in Vermont at the time. Um, and he said, you know, I think you'd really enjoy it. And I said, oh, okay, you know, it's your dad's music. So my reference to his father's music, um, Bobby and Dennis, was Lamb's Bread, which is a reggae band. And um, so, you know, I want to support local music. And I went and checked it out. And it was this groundbreaking music that I, definitely wasn't lamb's bread. It wasn't reggae music. It was death. And it completely blew my mind. I grew up just a little south of here uh, in the Shenandoah Valley. And, and I grew up listening to punk rock and, and hardcore punk and stuff like that in the 80s. And like it just rang so many bells. And I was like, oh my gosh, this music is completely incredible. Like... I want to be like, we got to do something. We got to do a music video. We got to do a documentary. We got to do something. I was just so amped and so excited about it. And uh, I had actually met this fella next to me on a music video that I directed. And uh, gosh, I think that was probably a year prior or two years prior. And, um, and I thought of him. I said, I, I shot the first interview with Bobby Hackney Jr. And I said, I got to give this guy Mark a call because he knows how to do movies. He had a movie he was working on. And I said, he's the perfect guy. He's got dedication. I, you know, and, uh, I'm going to send him the, at the time, the New York times article had just come out. I had just done the first interview and the New York times article came out and I was like, so excited. I said, Mark, check this out. There's a New York times article and there's this really amazing music. You got to check out. And so then he... yeah, I, I blew him off for two weeks because I was like, I ain't making no fucking documentary with you. <laughs> I had already tried making th like three documentaries at that point. And each one failed miserably. I, you know, you, want, you run out of money. They take years to make. Uh, you start, you know, seeing gray hairs in your head or less hairs on your head. And you're like, what the fuck am I doing with my life? And so I was like, dude, you have no idea the hell that you're asking for and spending years of your life and hundreds and thousands of dollars making this story. I just, I don't know if I'm the guy to do it. So I just blew up his email until finally I was having one of those, I'm a very sad, depressed filmmaker sitting in my office, staring at the wall, contemplating suicide. Let me look at his email. I like rock and roll. The doc that I had spent three and a half to four years on and pretty much $50,000 on that I, that went nowhere was a hip hop doc. And, um, I liked hip hop, but I wasn't as much of a fan of it as I was of rock and roll and metal and punk. And so I looked at your email and I heard the first song I played was, uh, well, well, first I read the New York Times article and I was floored that it was even a real story and, and a, like a full page story. And then I played Keep On Knocking and I like fell out of my seat and I called him back. And that was the start of making the film. And it was like a four year journey from that point on 
doing everything out of pocket again, which I didn't want us to do, but uh, we didn't really know any other way at the time. You know? so. Yeah, it was basically <laughs> um, probably two years into the making of the film um, that there was this Twitter post um, that appeared by this fellow, Scott Mosier, um, who then became our producer pretty quickly after that. For those um, that don't know, Scott Mosier produced every Kevin Smith film from Clerks to Chasing Amy. Even He even produced Goodwill Hunting. So I, like immediately when a friend of mine hit me up, this is what happened. Right. <laughs> we, we don't need to sugarcoat this shit. <laughs> Basically, Jeff calls me up from work. It's been like a year and a half of busting our asses making this film and getting nowhere feeling like, you know, we're running out of money. This poor guy was about to get a divorce. I mean, it was just total nightmare situation. I was going to sell my house, you know, sell all of my gear to survive. Like, he calls me up from work. He's like, Mark, this isn't working. We got to at least, you know, we, we either got to make this like a 10-year process where we film like every other weekend or something, or we just need to abandon the project altogether. And it was a pretty depressing conversation. I was like, let's think it over, you know, yada, yada. Hung up the phone. I think we were both feeling pretty miserable that day. Two hours later, a friend of mine started texting me, how come you didn't tell me Scott Mosier was all about your movie? Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, what the <laughs> f***, Scott Mosier? Like, clerks? <laughs> um, and I asked my friend, I was like, what are you talking about? And he's like, dude, he saw a trailer that you and Jeff put online, and he thinks the movie's done, and he's tweeting about how he wants to see it. <laughs> and so, so I was like, well, I wasn't on Twitter at that time, because I was like, you know, f*** Twitter. I don't know what Twitter is. Uh, I was like, can you send him a private message and give him my email address so that the whole Twitter world doesn't see it? And he's like, yeah, I think I can. He did that an hour later. Yeah. And then that yeah. night, actually, yeah. we were, um, Mark came over to my work and uh, at the time, yeah. and, and we got on a conference call, and we're talking to Scott Mosier, and he's like, how can I help you guys finish this film? Yeah. And we're like... <laughs> yeah, mind <It's> blown. <laughs> as soon as we heard his voice, I'm like, that's Scott Mosier. Yeah, right? That's definitely <laughs> Scott. <laughs> um, yeah. And so, yeah, Scott was kind of like... Uh, I, I call him a mother goose kind of producer where he came in and kind of oversaw the whole project from there and brought in another producing team that helped us find finishing funds. Yeah. One of uh, one of which uh, was Jerry Ferrara from the show Entourage. He played Turtle on that show. Um, he's actually the reason we were able to finish the film. He wrote the final check. Yeah, um, he did. But yeah, pretty much that whole team coming together and me and Jeff deciding we weren't going to give up, <laughs> like believing in ourselves and and our team is, is what got the film to the finish line. Yeah. And having the band be on our side, too. Yeah. Throughout the, the process. The band was, it, it um, was a blessing. I mean, we won't like, lie. We're... There was a major hip-hop artist that was trying to do a film at the time, um, at the beginning of the film. And the band ended up going with us over them, which was really kind. Because we had already spent about three to four months on the film, Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Whereas the other people were just after their fame and fortune of the yeah, story the, the, and, the, and the music is you know what what drew us both in you know that was like it i don't know you know how, how many of you guys have heard you know the album and or the albums um because now there's been you know quite a few from some of the demos that have come out and whatnot and uh it's still mind-blowing you know I put politicians on my eyes on and it, it still blows my mind. Yeah, I just so. remember when I first played that email, that email he sent me with the two tracks, I could not believe that the songs were that good. I expected it to be some garage band, you know, shitty recorded type music, but this was actually very well produced, very crisp sounding. I mean, yeah. there was nothing amateurish about it, you know, yeah. nothing, uh -huh. you know, these guys had played for years, you could tell, yeah. um, and they believed in it. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's really, really neat to see all the... Um, sort of as far as the music goes all the uh you know different tv shows that the, it's been in uh um, drag city records has actually you know pushed it out to to many different tv shows it's been in a few films um so it's it's really neat to kind of see well it's actually an entourage too a clip yeah, of entourage. yeah i mean it, it was I mean, for me the, the peak moment was so. the fact that they played a death song in an episode of ash versus evil dead but right right yeah. and that, i mean there's just been so many it's been really cool to see um it's been know, great to see it just flourish and, and the whole world just discover the music and and the band it's yeah. really awesome and uh and i don't know if you guys know this but it's mentioned in the Smithsonian uh, African American History Museum, we actually went there today. Got a couple of photos together, <laughs> which was awesome. But they have the original 45 that you're going to see in the movie there um, on display, as yep. well as uh, 
the two tracks that Jeff sent me in the email, actually. Yep. I think, right? Yep. Do they have keep on knocking too, or is it just politicians? I think it's politicians. Just politicians? Yeah, yeah. But anyway, <laughs> so, it's on the jukebox in, yeah, yeah. in the uh, listening um, room, so it's pretty pretty neat. Just so, let us know if we're yapping too much, you know? <laughs> <laughs> just give us a wrap it up. <laughs> Are we good? Yeah. Are we, if there's yeah. any questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's the gist of how the story came together. I, I'm trying to think of any other stories that we could tell about the making of it that are important um oh the, uh, when the edit so we shot the film in probably what three years or so roughly and yeah, then we started so, getting into the edit we're talking and, about 400 hours of footage <laughs> yeah it was a lot of footage <laughs> yeah. a lot of still photographs um that are kind of interweaved in the in the film um when we got it to uh the editor um he actually turned around a rough cut in about a month yeah. With 400 hours of footage <laughs> to be able to turn around a rough cut in a month is pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. And actually, it was pretty darn close to actually the final film. So for that to happen... Um, well, we, you know, with films, <laughs> the way it usually works is you're still editing all the way until your world premiere because the film is never, in sure. your mind, finished until they're like, well, your film's finished now because we took it and it needs to be finished right. um and so we had our world premiere at the los angeles film festival but but rich fox is the editor he's talking about yep. at the very beginning i think were we both being editors or was i being an editor i don't even remember we were kind of throwing we were, stuff at we, were, the we were trying to we were trying to do everything on our own and we just realized yeah. you know we we're killing ourselves because when you're you know directing every interview and shooting every interview and then logging every interview and then editing every interview it gets very draining i, mean, I was also doing sound as well as camera yeah um didn't want to hire anybody we didn't have any money um but uh but yeah rich fox was the editor that scott Mosier recommended for us and he had come off of the ozzy osbourne documentary at the time and yeah. so i knew he was used to different codecs and everything and, and he like Jeff said, was just a miracle worker. We gave him, really we was. gave him our notes, and he just kind of put it all, brought it all together. Yeah, so, um, yeah, he did a great job. We could um, do like a quick one or two questions, maybe. You think? <laughs> Unless you want us to keep talking, we can keep thinking of stories. You know. <laughs> Anyone got any questions at all? Or no? no? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you shot on film? No. Um, so the it, question was, uh, do we shoot it on film? Um, yeah, when so, Jeff, we didn't have yeah, we didn't have any money. <laughs> yeah, it was. I mean, very I, <laughs> I at the time that the film started, I mean, I was completely out of money, but I had all the film gear, and I told Jeff, I was like, I'll help you make this movie, but I ain't spending a dime. Yeah, I ended, like, up, I ended up like yeah. writing the, you know, we need to go to you know California and interview Jello Biafra. So he, and I want to go, <laughs> and I, you know, because I'm oh man, Jello Biafra, you know, and, and Mark's like. It, it actually came down to we had about 50 emails to jello and it came down to can we both go we don't have enough money like what's what's goes, best for the film basically he goes you know? a quick quick little thing about that is like mark gets there and he's using a ladder as a tripod right <laughs> yeah. so i mean it's yeah we're know, talking very low like budget low budget but when jeff came to me at the time there's a camera called a hvx 200 that had come out it did 1080p and um which was high definition at the time um it recorded on these things called p2 cards which were essentially flash drives and you could put two of them in if one recorded you could pop it out while the other one keeps recording yeah. so we knew it would be great for concerts you could literally record like non-stop for 24 hours if you wanted to on these things yeah. um and then it just links up in in the edit um and and it also has its own mixer on it for sound so it was literally like a, a film crew and one camera um, I owned it at the time. Um, I got it for a hip hop doc that I was doing before Jeff came to me, and and so with that and my light gear and whatever I sound gear, too. I think you bought a. I bought an HVX. You got an so HVX we, too, so we had so two. We had two. <laughs> so we did, you know, two cameras side by side, yeah. you know, audio going into them, whatever lights I had, yeah. you know, and and just kind of improvised from there. Yeah. <laughs> but but you know I I you know I always lit it. I'm, I was, I guess, the DP on it, but I always lit it like I would a narrative film. I was never thinking like a documentary because, again, I never wanted to make documentaries. I kind of fell into this. My whole goal from the beginning was to be a narrative filmmaker, and I always see lighting that way and telling stories that way. 
Um, and that's one of the reasons why Scott loved what he saw in the trailer so much is he's like, I haven't seen docs that look like this. Like yeah. usually it's more clinical looking. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, <Absolutely>. Anyway, <laughs> did that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. HBX 200 was a great camera. I, I miss it. I think they still make something like it that does 4k now, I'm sure. But, um, yeah. I've had, I've since, you know, that film put us in the poorhouse, so we've since had to sell everything we own. So we don't have anything anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A little digital camera. Yeah. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Got our iPhones. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, any other questions? No? You guys are all like, I just want to watch the movie. That's what I can't <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we can, no. we, I don't know. Do, uh, do, I was mad that Netflix took it. It was on oh, Netflix. Oh, yes. And yeah. like, it's a bummer. And then all of a sudden it was gone. And I was yeah. Like, what? <laughs> Netflix is, you know, we, it's been a double edged sword for us because we're like, man, it was on there for only a year. Right. But that's where we found our audience. Like, that's where everybody started talking about it. I remember one month we heard a report of like 500,000 people had seen it. And I was like, one month? Um, yeah. But it was only, it was our distributor only did a year deal. And, and once that was done, I guess they decided not to even try to bring it back there even though people were obviously into it yeah, um, i guess the investment too as far as that goes was like very netflix actually for you know independent filmmakers like us and a lot of other independent filmmakers gives independent filmmakers little chunks of the pie right so yeah. like well we didn't get any chunk of the pie us personally we got nothing and time, times have changed but, since then but, too it's it's know, not it the has, same as like now netflix only cares about original content unfortunately right. Um, yeah. They do still buy some groups of movies from distributors, but they they really don't put any effort into promoting them the but, way they were back then. Um, I but yeah, have to say like for the band though yeah. and the audience too, I think it's been a blessing. And mm. It's been great because there's been a lot of records sold because when it was on yeah. Netflix and stuff, and the band's been able to tour the world, like that's amazing, and that's you know mm -hmm. that that feels great to us that you know it's getting the name out there and. You know, that's, yeah, to, that's to me it not being on Netflix and also it's really hard to find it on Blu-ray and and DVD these days. Unfortunately, um, a lot of that has to do with our distributor who isn't necessarily around anymore. They kind of are, but they're just kind of like letting whatever films they have in their catalog be until they close shop. <laughs> um, that said, I did bring copies to sell people after this is over. Um, yeah, we got some pens. Yeah, we'll too. sign for you too. Free so, pens. You know, don't feel like you're just giving us money to get a right. fucking DVD with no signature. Or anything. Um, but uh, yeah, it's the uh, broke ass filmmaker fund. Uh, right. Make check out uh, Mark Christopher Camino or Jeff Hallett. Um, uh, is that? Um. <laughs> I'm sorry I laughed. I, I only laugh because it's like, that's a deep question. <laughs> um, I made a second film since then. It's called The Crest. Um, it's uh, it's available everywhere but Netflix. <laughs> um, but it's, a, it's kind of an Irish surfing documentary. It's about these two Irish-American cousins, one in San Diego, one in Cape Cod, who never knew about each other's existence until one of them found a blog written about a fiddle that was found in an attic in a rural part of Ireland. Um, they both are surfers and they both discover after they found each other just through emails, um, that, um, that they're surfers and also that their ancestors lived off the water, just like they do. One of them's a fisherman. Also, they also rode across three miles of treacherous ocean on long boats called Nabogues that were like surfboards that rode over waves. So they decide to meet for the first time in Ireland, uh, with the shared, uh, you know, appreciation of their ancestors, learn about their ancestors and go to the island that their ancestors are from, which is actually one of the islands that they shot the new Star Wars uh, movies in. It's where Luke lives. Those little beehives. That's all in my movie. <laughs> I filmed before Star Wars. <laughs> um, but that, yeah. that that's called The Crest, and that's available on Amazon, uh, maybe Hulu, uh, iTunes. It's on iTunes, yeah. yeah. Um and uh, there's there's a uh, I'm I'm in the be very beginning stages of probably what would be the biggest film um, of my life, but it might not happen, and it might happen, and I don't I'm at a point in my life where I've I've learned the industry. I don't like the industry, so I'm actually going to be happy either way if it happens or not. But let's just say it's it feels very close to happening, and it's on a very iconic. Uh, figure in yeah. music and film and i think everybody is gonna just 
they're gonna love the movie <laughs> if it gets made. Right. Um, yeah, and I'm but, psyched yeah. to be any part of that <laughs> yeah. too. Um, we've we kind of started the conversation with that, but uh, with that project, but um, it's kind of hush hush at the moment. It's, but <laughs> um, yeah, that's actually I haven't worked on a film since a band called Death. Um, but he's I'm, I'm psyched to to you know we we've, we've talked about this other project for a number of years. So. <laughs> These um, things take years. <laughs> they take so long. It really does. To, to get really through. Um, and it's exhausting. I mean, we you know, were, if you have a I wife guess, or kids, I mean, yeah. it's just like, it just takes over your life. <laughs> what were you going to say? We were just, yeah, honored that this one kind of came came about the way it did, you know, with the Hackney Sons coming up and just saying, hey, you know, we'd be honored for you guys to tell this story. And, and we, we are completely honored and honored that you guys are here. Um, you know, to watch it if you haven't seen it before. Yeah, and, and I'm, seriously, I'm like, you're here. thanks to the Library of Congress for for doing Absolutely. the screening. Um, I, I, you know, it is an important film, we think, and that's why we made it. <laughs> and yeah. uh, you know, if you haven't been to the African American Arts oh, and yeah. Culture please Museum, go to please that. go. There's a uh, the whole museum's mentions. amazing. You gotta yeah. start in the basement. There's like three floors in the basement. That's where the real deep history is, and work your way up to the very top and. Our, the death stuff, so that's the fun stuff. That's yeah. all the rock bands and everything. Um, but go see the whole museum. The whole it's museum. so worth it. Um, but our exhibit is on the top fourth floor to the left. Um, you'll see the Death 45 that you'll see in the movie with little stories that they wrote about it. And you can also listen to the music there, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so. But yeah, thanks everybody. Anyone, yeah. anyone else got anything before we go? Um, any questions though? Yeah. Quick question. Like we were saying at the ending, uh, if we have time, we could probably answer one or two, maybe even three quick questions. Yeah. Um, I usually raise the lights after the title flashes over the screen and, and let the credits roll and start the Q and A there. So yeah. that way people aren't sitting and waiting. So don't get up and be like, I gotta get the f out of here. I don't <laughs> want to sit through this whole credit roll. Um, we jump right into it as the credit roll starts. So, um, and stick around. we got We'd the like blu rays for sale too. <laughs> get that money out. Get them twenties. <laughs> All right. <laughs> It'd be great to speak to you guys, too. We'd be honored to. Yeah, yeah. We love talking about the film so, and answering questions. It's yeah. been a journey for both of us. Um, Absolutely. Um, so, I don't know. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. That's it. <laughs>